this week I have been painting eggs lots of eggs as you can see behind me and that got me thinking about how do we create the illusion of volume how do we use tone and shadows and highlights to make things look 3d so I would like to take you through how we alter tone and watercolour either through layering glazing or more directly and then also through the anatomy of um, shadows and highlights and volume and also how we can mix shadow colours either using complementary colours or analogous colours. I think it should be good. So my name's Liz Chatterton, I'm a watercolour artist based in Berkshire and every week I bring you a tip or trick that I wish I'd known about ages ago and this week it's all about tone and volume. In watercolour, if we want to lighten the tone of our paint, we haven't got the luxury of adding white to it, which we might do in oil paints or acrylics, because watercolour is transparent. So the white of our paper is effectively our white paint. And the way that we can lighten tones is by adding more water, or if we need to darken the colour, we do that by adding more paint. So it's a great exercise to do eight different squares and swatch out your colour going from the darkest straight out of the tube to the palest tint you can manage and that really helps you control your water and control the amount of paint on your brush so that you are in control and that's what I'm doing here and you can see I've gone from very dark to light trying to keep all those steps pretty even so that's not too bad. The second way you can do it is actually by layering and in this method we actually mix up a large quantity of quite thin paint and we paint those eight little squares identically. We then let that dry and because watercolour is transparent we can then put a layer over the top that we call glaze and that will make it slightly darker. So you can see me drying it here because each layer needs to be dry. Now I'm using exactly the same paint and I'm going to put a second layer on all except the very lightest square. And again, I'll let that dry and then I'll keep repeating that, but each time leaving one of the squares unpainted. So the top square will end up with eight layers and will be the darkest and the, the eighth square will only have one layer, so that'll be the lightest. And the theory is that if you're glazing, this is far more controlled. In the first direct method, I had to really judge how much paint and water I had in my mix, whereas this method, I can go dark in very, very small increments. And so it, it should be more controllable. Problem is, of course, you've got to dry it in between each of those layers, which is a bit of a pain. And you might get fuzzy edges where you don't quite paint over um, and line everything up. And also, as you can see here, actually, I've pretty much got to the darkest it's going to go. Some colours just will not go dark. And, you know, that's what the situation is. So we've got two methods of adjusting the tone. We've seen the two different ways of building up tone by layering or just going in direct. So what does that mean in practice? So why don't we just have a quick go at this cube. Just put the same colour all the way over in the first layer. And for the sake of this, I am going to include the shadow in that and then we'll have to let it dry because as we saw letting those layers dry is really important whereas if we are going for the direct route I might start with the top being the lightest area and I'll make sure I get that nice and light I would then make the, the face that's next to us as dark as possible. 
I would need to make sure that top was actually dry so that I don't get a fuzzy edge but for the sake of this you can see what's going on and then I might carry that on in the shadow so I've, I've actually lost the edge between this this face and the shadow but I'm going to actually make that shadow a bit lighter as it comes away which is closer to real life just make it a bit lighter there and then this side one needs to be sort of halfway in tone between the um, the lightest and the darkest and if you're not sure you've got the right tone do test it out on a spare bit of paper but that tone is probably about right and again I'd really need to make sure that side had been um, that was fully dry otherwise it's going to bleed in but for the sake of this demonstration I think I'll get away with it. So that's if we were doing it directly we just judge our tones, test them out and then have our light, our medium and our dark tone. Okay this one is dry so what I can do is leave that top surface with one layer on and then glaze over the side and the back surface to make them darker and in this case the shadow as well and then again just need to let that dry we would now put our third layer onto that back wall of the cube and of course our shadow so our shadow on both of these just merges into one and maybe we would want to differentiate that and we could even make that shadow just slightly darker again just to separate it out from our cube if we wanted to. Even this very simple exercise shows you a few of the problems. Um, with the layering you have to be very accurate otherwise you get you know tricky tricky edges where you've put layers over layers and there's all that drying to do whereas with the direct method you've got to again you've got drying otherwise you'll end up with fuzzy edges and you've got to judge your tones now i personally prefer to go for the direct method because i paint quite loosely but there's always a time when you could if you've say done that and you're not particularly happy with your tones of course you could still glaze on top to to sort things out so let's just have a think how that might work on a sphere rather than on that cube and let's also think about the color of our shadows here we've just used the same color and got deeper and deeper just picking up a little bit of red now from my palette i am going to paint my sphere put paint down and now with a wet brush i'm pulling that paint need to make sure I get a good clean edge on that so I've got a light here and basically a gradation down now I can add more pigment to the shadow area but red this red isn't a particularly dark red so that is as dark as my shadow is going to go and if that's dark enough for us, well, that's that's fine. But maybe I want a darker shadow. At which point I have two options. Either I can use a complementary colour and the complement of red, if I just pop some red there, is green. So if I had just a smidge of green in there, it will grey my red down and make it slightly darker and I could use that for my shadow colour just to darken things down. Downside of that approach is that it greys 
all the colour down. So if I wanted a bright red Indian rubber ball, I've lost some of that brightness. So what else could we do if we want to keep vibrant shadows? Well, let's do exactly the same over here. So again, I've got my red and I'm putting down and then with clean water, I'm just pulling that color out to get a gradation. Maybe pull a bit more out there. So I've got definitely got a highlight. Again, I can add more of my neat red to the shadow area, but that's as dark as it's gonna go. So what could I do? Well, I can use what we call an analogous co colour. So I look for a colour that is very close to my object colour, but darker. So this red here, which is a quite a bluey red, let's just grab some of that so you can see it there. Maybe I could use that for the um, shadow or even the next one along, which is a pinkier. No, I think the first one I chose, let's get it quite creamy because there's quite a bit of water on here. And I could use that for the shadow. Add that in. So it gets it darker, but can you see it doesn't take away the vibrancy of the color. And this can be a really nice way doing shadows, particularly on say flowers, where you want the vibrancy of the colour rather than greying it down. So that's the shadow on the object. And now we need to think about the cast shadow. Before I do the cast shadow, these need to be dry. I am going to do something and I'll explain this in a second. With my damp brush, I am just pulling out a little bit of light right at the bottom and I'll explain why in a second. So the cast shadow, the colour of the cast shadow, totally depends on the colour of the surface that the object is sitting on. So if it is sitting on a blue surface, the cast shadow will be a darker shade of blue. Sitting on a white surface, then it may well be a grey, a neutral colour. So let's do these as neutral. So I'm just, I'm going to grab a little bit of grey and right by the object is where it's going to be darkest. And that can be called the area of, um, I think they call it occlusion. So that's your darkest point. But as it comes away from the object, it gets lighter. And unless you've taken, or your, your object is in really um, bright, bright sunlight, the edges of your shadow are likely to be soft. If you've seen my um, film on edges, that you can soften them with a clean, damp brush. I'll just come round and just, you've got a nice soft edge there for a more believable shadow and I'm just going to come up to it and soften that edge. A bit awkward, just the angle. I'll just soften that so that's better. So that is your car shadow and the reason it does it's not dark all the way around is it's light bouncing off everything around it um, so that it's only right under the object that it that it's at its darkest and the edges are soft. And that little bit of light that I pulled out and said, oh, I'll come back to that. You often get a reflected light. So the light is actually hitting this surface and bouncing up so that underneath an object is often a little bit of reflected light. And you can see that quite often in white birds, it's almost like the orange of their feet is reflected under their belly. Now, that is a flat and boring 
um, shadow. It, it might be quite believable, I hope it is, but it's not that interesting. So what we could do, let's just come into this one. So again, I'm trying to paint quite carefully up to the object. And that's where my, it's going to be darkest. I'm then with clean water pulling it away so that it's lighter further away from the object and with a clean brush I'm just going to soften off some of those edges but just as we've got reflected light in the object you can have reflected colour in the shadow and if we drop in some of the object's colour into the shadow it suddenly becomes a lot, lot more interesting. Think about if you've painted a red object, having some red in that shadow or colours from objects nearby. So it's just worth thinking what we call these different elements because then when you hear about them, you'll know. So we have a highlight, which might be hard or soft, depending on whether it's in bright light um, or, or not. Then we have our light tones and light tones will be nearest to the light source. We have mid tones and darks. We have the form shadow And that can also be called the core shadow or the core shadow is the darkest bit of the form shadow. The form shadow is the shadow on, on the object. The core shadow is the darkest bit of it. We have reflected light. Which is just where light bounces off the surface. There and lights under the object. And then we have the cast shadow. Usually it gets lighter as it comes away from the, the object. And this is the darkest under, under that object. And as I say, there can be reflected colour in that shadow, which makes it far more interesting than if you just keep it as a darker tone of the surface it's on. And I wanted to show you the difference between using complementary colours to act as your shadow colour or analogous shadow colours. And hopefully you can see how different they are. So on this yellow sphere, I used a little bit of purple to mix in the grey of the shadow colour. On the red one, I added in a little bit of green. The blue one, I added in a little bit of orange. See how greyed down and muted those are compared to on the yellow. I used an orangey yellow to put in that shadow. On the red, a bluier red and on the the blue sphere it was a, a darker blue and I put that in as the shadow and that keeps these colours bright and clear so if you are painting particularly flowers and you want them to be lovely and clear then you need to use analogous colours in your shadows you know think if you were painting a daffodil do you want a grey daffodil or a banana for that matter no you don't so you might want to use analogous colours for your shadows.